on a variety of doctrinal issues, all of a sudden that goes away. And all of a sudden your means of output is suddenly stripped, you have no voice left. And so this is the first time since probably October of 2020 I've had a chance to actually be in a pulpit and deliver the word, to, uh, the word of God to God's people. So it's, for me, a soul rejuvenating, motivational, wonderful experience simply to be able to expel the words. So thank you for the opportunity. So that's a, uh, you should, it should never be, when you're a preacher, it should never be about you. But partially this morning it is. But mostly it's about his word. So hopefully uh, the Lord will give us unction this morning and we'll be able to deliver his word correctly. If you have your Bibles, I want you to flip to Joshua 5 for a moment. And I'm going to read the text, and then we're going to do uh, a bit of an introduction to what we're going to talk about this morning. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua 5. Starting down at the 13th verse. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And the man said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Father, this is your declaration. This is your word. This is your revelation, not contrived by man, but simply your message to us for today. Father, may we be mindful of the fact that we are not to take your word for granted. We are not to take your word lightly. We are not simply to cherry pick that which we like and disregard that which offends our senses. Father, may you change us by your Holy Spirit with the conformity of your Son, by the application of the truth that you have given to us in Scripture and the state. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, before we begin, can you get us a glass of water? My throat cries up really quickly, so uh, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, by way of introduction, I want to take us back a few years. Uh, it's 2003, I think it is. It's a page from recent history. And the date, the exact date, is, is Wednesday, March 19th, 2003. And the location is the nation of Kuwait. And uh, the location is the nation of Kuwait. Oh, thank you so much. The location is the nation of Kuwait. And the occasion is the eve of battle as the combined Allied forces prepared to invade Iraq in Desert Storm. The person is Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Collins, commanding 1st Battalion of Her Majesty's Irish Regiment. Colonel Collins addressed his men on the day before invasion with a speech that was copied in shorthand by one lone journalist embedded by the name of Sarah Oliver. And the speech goes as follows. We go to Iraq to liberate, not to conquer. We will not fly our flags in their country. We are entering Iraq to free a people, and the only flag which will be flown in that ancient land is their own. Show respect for them. There are some who are alive at this moment who will not be alive shortly. Those who do not wish to go on that journey, we will not send. As for the others, I expect you to rock their world. Wipe them out if that is what they choose. But if you are ferocious in battle, remember to be magnanimous in victory. Iraq is steeped in history. It is the site of the Garden of Eden, of the Great Flood, and the birthplace of Abraham. Tread lightly there. You will see things that no man could pay to see, and you will have to go a long way to find a more decent, generous and upright people than the Iraqis. You will be embarrassed by their hospitality, even though they have nothing. Don't treat them as refugees, for they are in their own country. Their children will be poor. In years to come, they will know that the light of liberation in their lives was brought by you. If there are casualties of war, then remember that when they woke up and got dressed in the morning, they did not plan to die this day. Allow them dignity in death. Bury them properly and mark their graves. It is my foremost intention to bring every single one of you out alive, but there may be people among us who will not see the end of this campaign. We will put them in their sleeping bags and send them back. There will be no time for sorrow. 
The enemy should be in no doubt that we are his nemesis and that we are bringing about his rightful destruction. There are many regional commanders who have stains on their souls and they are worth stoking the fires of hell for Saddam. He and his forces will be destroyed by his coalition for what they have done. And as they die, they will know their deeds have brought them to this place. Show them no pity. It is a big step to take another human life. It is not to be done lightly. I know of men who have taken life needlessly in other conflicts. I can assure you they live with a mark of Cain upon them. If someone surrenders to you, then remember they have that right in international law and ensure that one day they go home to their family. The ones who wish to fight, well, we aim to please. If you harm the regiment in its history by over-enthusiasm in killing or in cowardice, know it is your family who will suffer. You will be shunned unless your conduct is of the highest for your, is of the highest for your deeds will follow you down through history. We will bring shame on neither our uniform or our nation. As for ourselves, let's bring everyone home and leave Iraq a better place for us having been there. Now our business is north. That's considered to be one of the greatest stirring speeches of the modern era. I have, I have my doubts. I have certain qualms about it. Uh, for, so there's a lot of interesting political and foreign policy statements contained in that speech, and it's interesting. It's an interesting topic of discussion, but not for this morning. We're going to leave the politics out of this completely. My goal, by way of introduction, is to focus on two or three elements that are contained within the speech that are universal and timeless and have been on the shoulders of battlefield commanders ever since men first start this march to war. And those points are this. He says, there are some who are alive at this moment who will not be alive shortly. It is my foremost intention to bring every single one of you out alive, but there may be people among us who will not see the end of this campaign. As for ourselves, let's bring everyone home and leave Iraq a better place for us and been there. Those are the universal elements that every soldier, every battlefield commander, everyone who has ever directed people into combat has to bear. Because it requires planning, it requires strategy, it requires training, it requires tactics, it requires logistics, it requires a whole bunch of stuff. And inevitably what happens is that uh, the, the, the best laid plans never stand up the mustard the minute you make contact with the enemy. Anyone who ever, who's ever been in the military will tell you that. General Robert E. Lee, who commanded the, uh, the, the American Civil War, commanded the Army of the South, said this to one of his underling officers. He said, to be a great soldier, you must love the Army. To be a great commander, you must be willing to order the destruction of that which you love. There's two universal truths about war. Number one, in war, men die. Rule number two is there's nothing commanders can do to change rule number one. It's inevitable. So when we open up, when we're in the middle of Joshua 5, we, the passage I just read to you finds Joshua, it says that Joshua is up by Jericho. Deuteronomy 34 has just ended. It's been only a few short weeks since Moses has died. The nation of Israel is on a war footing. They're standing on the brink of the fulfillment of Genesis 12, 15, and 18, where God promised to Abraham 400 some odd years earlier that someday a nation is going to emerge that will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you the land of Canaan. And they're standing right on the doorstep of Canaan right now, second generation. They're going to go on a war of conquest, and they're sitting on a war footing ready to go. Joshua is up by Jer Jericho. That is the first target of opportunity in his uh, war matrix question is, what's he doing out there? Now, scripture does not tell us directly, so I think we, I'm going to make a several assumptions I think that are universal for anybody who's ever been in command, who has the responsibility of leading men into war. Is he out there perhaps surveying the battlefield? How tall are the walls? How many, are, how many gunmen are on the, on the parapets? What's the access routes? What are the egress routes? What does the terrain look like? Is, as a commander, is he surveying the battlefield? I would think so. That's a pretty logical assumption to make. Is he praying or meditating? Probably. Scripture is very clear as a man of God. He is devoted to Yahweh. He has served Moses faithfully for over 40 years, and he's praying and perhaps meditating about what the next day's events are about to hold. Is he reflecting on the events of the past 40 years? 
I mean, if you stop and think about it, there's only two men alive that can remember who were there, who saw the exodus, where God, in a single moment, opened up the waters of the Red Sea and destroyed, in a heartbeat, the world's greatest international superpower, the land of Egypt. He was there. He saw it happen. Is he wondering how, what's it going to be like to replace Moses? Moses was a great man of God. Moses was a man who had the rare privilege of asking the question, show me your face. And God says, I will not show you my face. I will show you the backside of me. It's like, as I walk past you, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and you'll see my back most parts, but my face you shall not see, for the minute a man sees my face, he shall not live. Moses had the privilege of being with God one-to-one -one in a relationship that you and I can only dream about. What's it going to be like for me as leader? He put up with all the complaints for 40 years. He was the administrator, the chief justice. He had to put up with all the nonsense that the Israelites could throw at him. What's it going to be like? I saw what Moses went through. Well, I fail at a critical moment. He's going to wonder how the nation will respond. I mean, Israel, the last 40 years, has got one of the worst national track records of faithfulness recorded in all of Scripture. They go out in the desert. There's nothing out here. Pharaoh's army is going to kill us. Let's go back to leeks and onions. They're delivered through the Exodus. They complain. They get on the other side of Exodus. What did they do? Oh, you brought us here to die. We have no food. We have no, we have no meat. He gave us manna when they, claimed, they complained about food. They got the quail when they complained about meat. Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days to speak with God face to face to get the Ten Commandments, to get the law of how to, how to govern this nation of ungrateful people. On the, on the 39th day or the 40th day, what do they do? Moses comes down, he sees a golden, the golden calf. No sooner, had, no sooner had Moses been away for a short period of time, they begin to fall away and begin worshiping idols. 3,000 were killed that day. They complained about water twice in the desert. Moses strikes the rock, and the second time he did that, it cost him his life because he was not permitted to enter the land of Canaan. Every critical moment in Israel's history in the past 40 years, every time he looks at the resume of the people he's commanded to lead, they have failed constantly. What makes me think that this time is going to be any different? How will the nation respond? He's maybe doing the mental math of how many casualties there will be. How many mothers are going to lose their sons? How many wives are going to lose their husbands? He saw the time when the spies, originally when he was one of the 12 spies who went originally to the land of Canaan. 10 came back and said what? They're too big, they're too fast, too many tanks, too many guns, too many planes, too many ships, they're too well fed, they're too strong, they're too well armed, too well fortified, they're too, too, too much for us. What does Joshua and Caleb say? He's okay, God's given to us, we can take, we can take these guys. There's actually a really interesting side lesson in all that, that Majority isn't always right. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so scripture reading is 5-1. Joshua stands by Jericho. He lifts up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or against us? says neither. He said, no, I'm commander of the Lord's army. I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of the Lord going around the city once. Thus you, you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then when then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and all the, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, and they will straight before him. The book of Joshua is a, uh, I call it a hinge book or a pivotal book in the Old Testament canon. 
not everybody will agree with me on this minor point, but I consider Moses to be one of the patriarchs. And so at the close of Deuteronomy, you've got this entire patriarchal canvas comes to a close. Uh, Genesis 12, 15, and 18 really begins fulfillment at Deuteronomy chapter 34 as Joshua's on the eve of battle. And so now you've got this whole, this new economy begins to come into redemptive history with the end of Moses and the coming of Joshua. And so um, I think it's a good idea just to recap slightly the events where the nation is right now. Moses, as we know, is dead. He was forbidden to enter the promised land for the sin of, that's a different sermon all to itself, why he was excluded for striking the rock instead of talking to the rock at a key point in redemptive history. But Moses is dead. The nation mourns, they mourn for, for several weeks. And Joshua in chapter one is appointed as successor and uh, tells Joshua it's his job, it's his time to lead the nation over the Jordan and take the promised land. One of the other interesting things about the book of Joshua and in many other books in the Old Testament, it really is a book of, that describes the sovereignty of God as being absolute and the responsibility of man as being absolute. The two go hand in glove. Oftentimes theologians will debate that, you know, is it the sovereignty of God or is it the responsibility of man? I think it's a silly argument because both are true at the same time. I'll just, it, it comes through the entire book. I'll show you a, just a quick example of this in the first chapter. 5 to 8, verse 1, 5 to 8. God says to Joshua, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. That's divine sovereignty right there. It's gonna, you're going to win. I'm going to be with you. You can't be defeated if I'm with you. All right? Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to, the, to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. There you've got divine sovereignty. I'm not going to leave you for sake. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to make things happen. The victory is in your hand. But you've got to be strong. You've got to do. You've got to believe. You've got to have faith. You've got to be able to act on the promises on the commandments that are given to you in Moses. The two go hand in glove. Spirituality, true faith, doesn't begin by simply reading your Bible, sitting in your Bible, hoping things happen. It means that we, 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 we learn about God. We talk about God. We memorize God. But then we also have to put those words into action as faithful individuals. And that's throughout the book of Joshua, in fact, throughout the entire scripture, just pointing out one verse. This time Israel again sends out uh, spies in order to, to, to examine the land in chapter 2. This is where we're introduced to Rahab. And Rahab sees the hand of God in these men. She asks a favor of them. She asks a favor, um, she, she hides the spies and says, could you make me a promise that once the, the battle begins, once the onslaught starts, that you will spare my family. We have seen the hand of God working in the nation of Israel. It's interesting to note that Rahab appears in Matthew 1, 5 in the lineage of Jesus. We note that in chapters 3 and 4, uh, Israel crosses the Jordan River. And in chapter 5, all the males of Israel receive the mark of, mark of the covenant in their flesh by way of circumcision. All children and adults, all the adult males alike are circumcised because all the entire generation of men who were unfaithful and condemned to walk the wilderness for 40 years, they're all dead. They put the sign of the covenant on the new generation that's about to go to war. And so as chapter 5 opens up, the nation is healing. They're recovering from, from this uh, surgical event. They celebrate the first Passover in the Promised Land. And on that day, the manna stops. They began to enjoy the blessings of, inter of entry Palestine and tasting of the produce of the land that Palestine produces. Which brings us up to date, chapter 5, 13 to 15. This is where we spend most of our time. As I said, Joshua is surveying the battlefield. And in front of him, he sees a man who's dressed in desert camouflage gear. He's got a Kevlar helmet, bulletproof vest, five bandoliers of breast, so ammunition, hand grenades, bayonet, knife, sidearm, combat boots, night vision goggles. This guy's decked up for war. This is a warrior in every sense of the word. Then Joshua asks him a very sane and reasonable question. He says, are you with us or against us? Understandable. He's in enemy territory. He's surveying the field of battle. Here's a man who's dressed for war, ready for action. And he asks a logical, 
military, political, tactical question. Are you with us or against us? Are you a friend or a foe? Do I invite you to my tent for hospitality or do I kill you where you stand? Who are you? It's a, it's a political, tactical, military question. And it's interesting the response that Joshua gets. So what he, instead of getting a political, military, tactical answer, he gets a theological answer. The man says no. Some translations say neither. I'm neither for you nor against you. Now that is a startling answer. It's startling in the sense that when you consider where Israel sits in the plan of redemptive history in God's economy, they are the chosen nation. Deuteronomy chapter 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it is not because you are more number than any, any, than any other peoples that the Lord set his love on you and chose you if you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we see a very similar sentiment in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2. Paul goes to tremendous pains in Romans chapter 3 when he talks about all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the, the rhetorical question he asks is, well, if all, are, if all of sin then fall short of the glory of God, what benefit is there being a Jew? What's the big deal about being a Hebrew? And Paul says, much, because to the Hebrews were trusted the oracles of God. They were the only nation on planet Earth that were God revealed himself personally to a nation. They received the commandments of God. They were to be a light in a dark world. They were, to, they were to carry the good news to pagan nations. They were the ones entrusted with the truth of God, the real tr truth about God. There's much. In spite of the privileged status that Israel enjoyed, and I would say the privileged status that the church enjoys, we are the bride of Christ after all. We are the recipients of truth. We have... Uh, we are ready to evangelize the world, we're to be, we're to be salt and light in this country, in this nation, and around the world. We, 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 are, we have a special privileged status. But in spite of that, he's, the commander says, I'm not with you or against you, but I command the armies of God, and now I have come. Startling. When the, when the commander of the armies of the Lord makes the statement, Joshua in a heartbeat knows exactly in whose presence he stands. The commander tells him to take off his sandals, for the place upon which he stands is holy ground. Where have we heard that expression before? Exodus chapter 4. What happened in Exodus chapter 4? The burning bush. God calls him from God calls him on Sinai, a bush that's not being consumed. Take off your sandals, for the ground upon which you stand is holy. Mm -hmm. The term holy is a multifaceted term. There's a lot that, that's a body to use term holy. It has to do with moral perfection of the absence of evil. It's obvious. It also means altogether other or completely different or set apart from anything in creation. Holiness is the single attribute it's the defining attribute that defines all attributes. When the angels, Isaiah chapter 6, circling around the throne, are the, the night and day, what do they scream to each other? They, they're screaming, mercy, mercy, mercy is the Lord God Almighty. They're saying, love, love, love is the Lord God Almighty. Is that the single defining attribute? What do they say? He's holy. Because holiness defines the definition of love. It's not simply love, 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 but it's a holy love. It's a holy mercy. It's a holy omnipotence. It's a holy sovereignty. Holiness qualifies everything about God. And so this man says, you are standing in the presence of a holy God. Take off your sandals for the ground upon you is holy. Question. What makes the ground holy? There's nothing special about the piece of clutter, dirt upon which Joshua was standing. It's dirt. Dirt is dirt is dirt. Sand is sand is sand is dirt. It has no special attributes to it except to be when you turn, add water to it, it turns into mud. It's sand. It gets in your eyes, gets in your sandals, and clogs up machinery. 
what makes anything holy or sacred when God either indwells it or God blesses it or God is present at it, at that point, wherever God resides, that item, that artifact, that place, that location, that person becomes an object of sacredness. It's the presence of God that does it. Second Peter says, you are a royal, speaking of the church, you are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people chosen for his own possession. I know me and I know you and you're not that much different from me and I know that all of us have all kinds of funny stuff inside that is icky and if ever got out we'd all be embarrassed, right? What makes us holy? Why are we a holy nation? Not because we are anything uniquely special, it's because at the point of conversion, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, takes up residence, regenerates, changes our minds, changes our disposition, redirects our focus. And at that point, because the holy presence of God resides within us, we become a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a holy people unto God because the presence of God is within us. Joshua recognizes in a moment that the man before him is not merely an angel or powerful being, that this is a, he probably doesn't have a word for it yet or name, have a name for it yet, but I think what he sees here is the pre-incarnate visitation of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the commander of the Lord's army. And what does he do? He falls down and worships. That's his reaction. He falls down and worships and he's not rebuked. In every other instance where, and where man in the Bible makes the mistake of worshiping a celestial being, a celestial being corrects him and says, worship is due God alone. Here he's not corrected. It's being <clears throat> accepted. Which means the only person, according to, uh, to, to Old Testament law, that accept worship is God and God alone. I want you to notice something about the worship, the nature of the worship here. Not what he's doing, what he's not, but what's, all the things that are missing. He's worshiping, but there's no choir. Nothing wrong with choirs. Choirs, I enjoy choirs. There's no buildings. Nothing wrong with the building. There's no mention of liturgy. Again, nothing wrong with liturgy. There's no congregation. There's no music. Nothing wrong with music. There's nothing there but Joshua and the Lord. And he's worshiping. How do you worship without stuff? I mean, one of the things that disturbs me about many, many churches is that their view of worship, I think, is, is, goes beyond what Scripture says in many ways. Their worship is all the stuff that takes place out here. Liturgy, worship, choirs, music, building, program, blah, 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 blah. And all that stuff can be helpful in focusing on worship. But worship, that's not what worship is. Worship is, it begins in here. Recognizing that when we walk in the door, we walk in amongst God's saints, we're with the holy people of God, that we are, our attitude, our hearts, our minds have to be redirected to a place where we are coming into the presence of someone who knows us better than we know ourselves, who can undo us like that. He can take us at a moment if he wants to. We could, we could be standing before you get home this afternoon, you, I hope not, but <coughs> some, some people are going to face the judgment seat of God and the, at, the, the, the demand to be made of what you did in this life. Worship begins recognizing that God simply is not to be taken lightly. He's to be taken joyously and gratefully and lovingly, but never lightly, never callously, never simply as something to add on to your, uh, add on to your, to your, to your teaching or get on a rabbit's foot. Worship is here, knowing who, who presence we sit on. It's a question of the heart, the attitude. It's an awareness, a fearful awareness of the awesomeness of God. It's only after he begins to worship that he asks this man, what would you have me do? He says, instead of getting tactical instructions, Joshua is told that he's in the very presence of God. Take off your shoes. For the ground upon which you stand is sacred. Well, and then of course the chapter finishes with Joshua receiving some of the most unorthodox military instructions I have ever read. From a human standpoint, it makes absolutely no sense. There's no battery ramps, there's no tanks, no catapults, no flaming arrows, nothing. Just walk six times on seventh day, do it seven times, so I blow, blow the truck, boom, the walls come tumbling down, you go inside and take it off. Because the commander of the Lord's army is here, and he's going to ensure the victory of the day. As I, has been, as I have been with Moses, so I will be with you. In the case of Joshua, the lessons that we can draw from this text is um, 
this is a few implications. It confirms the promise that as God was with Moses, he's now with Joshua. He's letting Joshua know, give me a pat on the back. It's okay. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. I made mean, it with you. You do your part, I'll do my part. I'll take down the walls, I'll give you the victory, all you do is do the mop up action afterwards. He reassures Joshua that unlike the first generation's failure to conquer the land, this time is going to be different. Well, it's different, but it's not. If I ever come back here again, I'll talk about Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, the other side of Jericho, what we're going. He reassures Joshua that victory is going to be at hand. The other lesson that comes through the loud and clear from this text is that if I could be allowed to be flippant for a moment, um, is that God is his own man. What I mean by what do I mean by that? I mean that he has his own agenda, he has his own timeline, he has his own means of getting things done. He's going to get things done in his own time, in his own way, and nothing, and I mean nothing, and I mean nothing, is going to stand in his way for accomplishing the goals that he has set out for himself to do in the plan of redemptive history. And again, by the time I take Genesis, Genesis chapter 20, um, Abraham and Abimelech, I'll show you how, how God suddenly intervenes to, 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 to maintain the lineage by which Messiah would come. But God is his own person. He makes his own plans. He doesn't ask for our opinion. He doesn't ask for our timeline. He doesn't consult with us on how the redemptive history is to unfold. With or without the church, with or without us, with or without anything, he's going to bring about the plan that he has for this plan of redemption. He's not on the side of anyone. We dare not confuse him with the United States or Canada or any other nation. He has blessed this country. He has blessed, he has blessed the Western Hemisphere abundantly. By the time the blessing, I fear, is coming, maybe, maybe drawing to a close, as the wrath of God is being revealed against all righteousness, Romans 1 and 18, 32. He's not to be confused with any political party. He's not a conservative. He's not a liberal. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not a sucker, he's not NDP, he's not Green Party, Blue Party, Yellow Party, Martian Party, or quasi-something-else party. He's not to be wrapped up in any of that. He's his own person. He's not to be found or wrapped up in any founding document. As much as I admire the U.S. Constitution, I think it's one of the most intriguing documents ever devised by man because the founders understood the nature of corruption and power, and it's, it's, as, terms of, as, as a governing document, it's beautifully structured. But as beautiful as it is, he's not to be wrapped up in a founding document. The U.S. Constitution, the Canadian Constitution, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as much as great as those things are, God has his, own, has his own agenda. He's not to be confused with any country. He's not to be confused with any religion. He's not bound in to, to bless, adhere, to be associated with, or be exclusively involved in any one particular philosophy or even Christian denomination. And that's going to sound almost radical in some cases, but I do believe that the denominations have their place. They fulfill a much needed uh, uh, role in God in the redemptive economy, only because that, that we are sinful people and we require denominations to keep lines of, uh, of doctrine straight, straight and narrow sometimes. But he's not associated with any one particular denomination. He's involved with Baptists, he's involved with Presbyterians, he's involved with OPC, he's involved with a whole bunch of things. He's not involved with the United Church, I can tell you that. <laughs> Actually, here's a blessing from this pandemic. I said this a couple of times to some friends of mine. That the only blessing by this whole pandemic is the fact that many of the liberal United Churches have shut their doors for the last 16 months. That's a good thing. <laughs> Anytime you can stop heresy, that's a, that's a good thing. We should never make the claim that God is on our side. We need to walk there very, very carefully, very carefully. I'm a student of history, church history specifically. And I did a major major paper that was up, it's up for publication uh, on the revivals that took place in the, during the American Civil War. And I've read, I've read sermons by both northern preachers and southern preachers. And I've got to tell you, the, the sermons of that era are garbage. A lot of them are just garbage. Um, you get the northern preachers wrapping the, wrapping the northern war of aggression as God's on our side. You, got this, you have these rebels in the south, these traitors, these rebellious children. We're, we're, we're to treat these rebellious tra traitors like the book of America says we're to kill them. Southern preachers are preaching, these are northern Philistines, we're the new Jerusalem, we're the light, we're the true light on earth. These are the northern Philistine invaders, we need to stop them from, from, from hammering our idyllic garden of Eden down here. Horrible messages. And the justifications for slavery, horrible. 
both claiming God is on our side. Now, one of the most interesting speeches ever made was by Abraham Lincoln in January 1865 in his second inaugural address. He wasn't a Christian. I don't believe he was a Christian. I think he was, was well-versed in scripture. He was a deist. He was a rational individual. He understood the role of providence. But he said this, in this present conflict, one side must be, and both sides may be wrong. That may be the providence of God is using this particular war to punish both sides for the atrocities administered to our fellow man for 200 years of slavery. It's level head to One of the very few people in the 1800s that made a mature biblical response that way. One side must be, both sides may be wrong. And so I say as a warning to all of us that um, we can be very, very careful when we ask the question, God, are you on our side? Wrong question. Wrong question, because now you set the agenda. You've set the agenda, and now God must bless that agenda. The question you should be asking is, God, are we on your side? What have you demanded from faithfulness? What have you demanded from righteousness? What have you demanded from how we respond Christ-like in any given situation that confronts us? Are we on your side? And I know where I stand on a number of issues, but I try to hold them as humbly, as graciously, as meekly as I can, because I know that I don't have a monopoly on truth. Neither does anybody else. And so I have a number of positions. I'm, if you want to ask me about that uh, outside the pulpit, I'm not going to get into politics, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's appropriate at this point as a guest preacher here. But I'll simply say this, that uh, in any situation, we need to always ask the question, Lord, what's your plan? What's your agenda? What, and a lot of things you're very clear about. A lot of things are very, very clear. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to steal. We're not to lie. We're not to fornicate. We're not to embezzle. We're not to, we're not to forsake fellowship. We're not to forsake a lot of things. There are a lot of things we're supposed to do. Love the widow, and the widow and the orphan. We're to walk the extra mile. We're to love our enemies. Turn the other cheek. These are things that are very clear. But in some situations, it's perhaps not so clear. And we need to prayerfully, humbly, meekly go to Scripture, go to prayer, and ask the Lord, What's your take on the present situation? Because dark, if you're heading a certain direction, you want to make sure we head the same direction with you. Because I guarantee you, with us or without us, redemptive history will march on according to his timeline. And frankly, I'd rather be on the side, on his side, rather than being on the wrong side. Okay? Okay.